Well, this week we are continuing to look at our spiritual MOT. Things in life that it's good to check are working well. And today's part of your MOT is a very important part of your car and a very important part of your life. And it's the brakes. It's an interesting part of a car, the brakes. See, the purpose of a car is to move, but the purpose of the brakes is to stop it moving. So, they're one of the most important parts of a car, but they also run counter to the reason the car's there. But without brakes, let me tell you, if you're in the car, you would be in trouble. Anyone who has ever been in a car before where the brakes have failed knows this. I thankfully have never been in a position where they failed and I was going fast. But I do remember a time, and I was a pretty new driver at this time, heading up the causeway um, to the roundabout near the library, only to feel when I pressed my brakes, they just went straight to the floor with no resistance and nothing happened. And the car did not slow down at all. And all I can describe, I mean, uh, thankfully I thought, handbrake, that'll stop me. <laughs> but the feeling I remember, and the only way I can describe the feeling is with, ah! <laughs> it's scary when your brakes don't work. They're an extremely important part of driving a car. And as I started looking at the subject, I had no idea where we were going to go with this. But I realized I didn't know very much about how brakes work. And I'm going to try and not look at Alan during any of my description in case I'm way off base. The earliest bricks for cars were a very simple lever on the side of the car. And what they did is they pulled a block of wood against the wheels. And that was fine in those days. Um, the, the picture I get of that is, you know, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang had a big lever. That's the kind of thing that these big lever, or um, the only other picture I got in my head, which is probably just me, is Toad of Toad Hall in a big car with a big lever. That's what brakes used to be, wooden blocks that you pulled a lever and they stopped the wheel. Now that was fine for a steel rimmed car. Um, it was also fine if you didn't go over 20 miles an hour. Once cars started going faster and started having rubber tires, that wouldn't do the job. The hydraulic brake came along in 1914, created by a guy called Fred Duesenberg. I'm guessing he was German, uh, on his racing cars. And this system of braking that he had, uh, that he created, actually it would have earned him an absolute fortune if he'd just thought to patent it. But he didn't, so it didn't. But they are an amazing invention. Just think for a moment, you can stop your car by moving your foot a bit. Isn't that amazing? You can stop a moving vehicle by going like, that. Just get your head around that. Let me tell you, your foot is not capable of stopping a metal object that weighs about three tons and travels up to speeds of 70 miles an hour, but no more. <laughs> your foot can't do that. I don't care how strong your foot is. You could even be built like Shane, and your foot's not going to be able to do that, unless you're Fred Flintstone. <laughs> Yet the hydraulic braking system allows you to stop a moving vehicle with your foot. And it works like this. A car in motion is full of energy, kinetic energy. That's the energy of motion. And what a brake does is it uses friction to convert that energy into a different type of energy. It doesn't just clamp the wheel so the wheel stops because you would crash. It uses friction to slow the wheel down and converts the energy into heat. So when you put your foot down on the brake pedal, a connected lever pushes a piston into a master cylinder. I'm not looking at Alan. <laughs> which is filled with hydraulic fluid. That hydraulic fluid gets squirted along a system of pipes into another pipe, into another pipe, into wider cylinders, and then next to the brakes on each wheel. How am I doing, Alan? 
Wonderful. <laughs> this hydraulic system, what it does is it multiplies the force of your foot on the brake to enough force to apply the brakes and make the car stop. Can you just turn this down just a touch? I'm just getting a bit of ring back. The disc brakes, which what go against the wheel, uh, consists of a brake disc, a brake caliper, and a brake pad. That's okay. When the brake pedal is depressed, the hydraulic fluid causes the brake caliper to press the pad against the disc. And the rubbing of this and the friction that it causes turns kinetic energy into heat. How much heat? A lot of heat. A speeding car stopping can generate heat in the brakes up to 510 degrees Celsius. Five times hotter than boiling water. And add 10. That is a lot of heat. Now to withstand that, brake pads are made of very special material that will not melt at high temperature. It's built to cope with the heat. That can make a speeding car stop in a very small space of time. It's your brakes that stop you hitting things with your car. It's your brakes that keep you out of danger. And it's your brakes that can prevent a nasty collision. In 1 Timothy 1.9, Paul uses a great metaphor for faith going off track. It says, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. Now I dare say, Paul uses this particular metaphor because it was an easy one for people to understand at the time. But if the internal combustion engine existed at the time of Paul, he may very well have said, make a car crash out of your faith. What stops a car crash? Your brakes. If by rejecting faith and a good conscience leads to a crash, then holding on to faith, holding on to a good conscience is pressing the brakes. And the question that I have for you this morning is very simple. Have you had your brakes checked? When you are running into trouble, when temptation comes, when sin starts knocking at the door, when you're about to choose your will and not God's will, what is it that stops you? And I believe it's very simple. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit that comes into play in these times. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23, we read the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. I believe the breaks in the Christian life is self-control. There are very many instances in Scripture where we are encouraged to live a life where we grow in self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Sober-minded can also be translated as alert, vigilant, and controlled. If we could learn to grow in self-control, how many problems would we avoid? How many sticky, awkward, contentious situations would not have taken place if we pressed the brakes? How many moments of despair, depression, or anxiety could have been held at bay? Let me tell you, of all of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control is the most personal and the most inward See, the others in the fruit of the Spirit deal with how we relate to other people. But self-control deals with how you relate to yourself. 
our struggles with control of fear, control of anger, control of addictions, indulgence, laziness, escapism, all of this happens inside of us. This struggle is with ourselves, and most people cannot see it going on. Yet the evidence of the struggle becomes very public. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness are things you can all demonstrate on other people. But I can only demonstrate self-control on me. The minute I try and put self-control on someone else, it's just control. And it's a curious thing, self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit, but it contains the word self. Yet living by the Spirit and relying on self are the opposite. Now, I'll get into some details in this a bit, but we need to understand up front. Self-control is not achieved through self. It is truly achieved through the Spirit. Self-control is a work of the Spirit. Any attempt to control your fight against temptation, to control your fight against sin that comes from self, let me tell you, it will fail eventually. We can only rely on the Spirit of God to defeat temptation. No matter how much it looks like a person has their act together, no matter how high their hands are raised on a Sunday, if they're fighting temptation in their own power, in their own will, in their own direction, let me tell you, they are not really in control. The surface might look calm, but there's a war going on deep down. That's why the world's idea of human potential, human purpose, success, and self-control just doesn't really work. Because man cannot control himself on his own. There's a peace missing. And the problem is it's in our nature. Sin is in our nature. And that's what we need to get rid of, our nature. We get rid of our human nature and we take on another nature. Real self-control goes absolutely against human nature. You know, we people, we are a bunch of desires wrapped up in a body. We want what we want and we'll scream till we get it. And no matter how hard you try to put a lid on your own desires, they're going to pop up. They'll find a way and they'll pop up at the moment you don't want them to. It is human nature. The only real way to get self-control is to lose control of self. Now before we get into how self-control works, we need to ask some questions. What does self-control keep us from? What does self-control prevent us from crashing into? Now, I'm going to say this up front. I am probably going to offend every person in this room at some point during this. Take it. <laughs> if you feel like I'm having a go at you, I'm not. But take it in the spirit that it's meant. I am going to be indiscriminate. Is that okay? If I offend you, it's not me who's offending you. Yeah? Sometimes we have a difficulty in church when we talk about sin. We go big, and we only go big. We go adultery, booze, theft, murder. And what we do when we do that is we go, yeah, God, get them. But that's not me. I'm good. Yeah? And what we do is we miss some of the other stuff. We also narrow some of them down to such a narrow definition that conveniently enough, it doesn't include us. Yeah? I mean, I get what that word means, but if I narrow it enough, oh, I'm outside of it. Yeah? Well, what I'm going to do, instead of going like that, I'm going to go like that this morning. See, Jesus, when he came around, he started upping the stakes when it came to sin. He said, oh, you say you're not an adulterer, but you've looked lustfully at someone. You've committed adultery in your heart. You say you're not a murderer. Well done. But you're living a life in hatred. You're a murderer. 
See what Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't go like that with sin. Jesus <laughs> went like that when it came to sin. Jesus narrows the get out clause and he drives home the real issue with sin. And let me tell you, there is no small sin. There is no, eh, it doesn't matter, sin. And unfortunately, what we can do is we focus on the headline grabbers. And we divert our attention from the other things that are just as serious to God, but are taken less seriously by most Christians. But all of these things that I am going to describe can lead to a car crash of your faith. And we need to take each one of them seriously, not to try and get ourselves out the frame, not so we can feel bad, but so we know when to press the brakes. And I'm expanding on these things not to bring offense, not to bring condemnation, but so that you can think a little bit more about the hazards in the road. I passed my driving test a long time ago, but I believe now you sit on a computer and you've got to identify hazards. Well, it's good to spend some time identifying hazards so you know when to push the brakes. See, there's a danger here as well that all I'll do is give you a long list of things. But I want to get into some detail on some of them. Don't take what I'm about to say as all-encompassing. If I've missed something, it doesn't mean it's not a sin. <laughs> but there really is no way... I mean, what I want to do is point out that there's more things that can cause you to crash your spiritual car than murder. And there's no real way to do this without a list of some kind. Now, it's... If you try and find a list of sins in the Bible, helpful though that would be, there really isn't one. But there are a number of lists that we can put together. So let's start with a passage that immediately precedes the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, verse 19 to 21. This is the works of the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And just in case you've thought of something else, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, all of those things are car crash material. So let's do a list. Number one, sexual immorality. Now, some versions of the Bible will translate this word as adultery. But actually, that's too narrow a description. Um, and to narrow it just to adultery kind of misses the point. The Greek word used here is the word pornea, where we get a very obvious word from today. But essentially, it means a surrender of sexual purity. So yes, it includes pornography, it includes adultery, but it's wider than that. Include all lustful thoughts in that. This is adultery in the heart and mind that Jesus was speaking about. This is letting lust cause you to compromise. The next one is impurity. Now, this is a very similar word. Some versions of the Bible say fornication, but the word actually means impure. And what it means is a misuse of sexual desire. It means not just being lustful, but giving in to lust. Pornea is giving in to sexual sin, but impurity is bigger. It's letting it take over your life. The next word is sensuality, which it kind of sounds like there's some repetition going on here, but actually it's not repetition that's happening. The word that's used in some versions of the Bible says lewdness. And lewdness is actually a really good translation. The Greek word, oh dear me, I can't pronounce this one. There's a Greek word, as, aselgia. Is it close enough? That'll do. Uh, it's taking it to another level. It's not just letting lust take over, but it's this kind of sense that it's lost its sense of shame. It's lost its sense of embarrassment. It's a parading of lustful sin. Another good word to describe it is when it becomes debauchery. So these first three, these aren't repetitions, these are escalations. 
It starts with thoughts, it moves to taking over, and the third one is just lost any sense of inhibition whatsoever. Right, that's the sex out the way. Let's move on. Idolatry. Now, obviously, this one includes the worship of false gods, which can come in many, many forms. Sure, there's Allah, Buddha, Krishna, etc., etc. But it's not just limited to that. It's about anything that takes the rightful place of God in your life. It can be money. It can be fame. It can be grandchildren. It can be children. It can be work. I'm guessing that one's not a popular one. It can be entertainment. It can be money. It can be sport. It can be validation. It can be affirmation. Let me tell you, if you're seeking affirmation for your spiritual gifts rather than seeking God through them, it becomes an idol. If you're, if you're only going out there to make sure people are saying, well done, that's idolatry. And let me tell you, if you have a low self-image, you can get hooked on that one. Anything that takes over, here's a good test. Do you talk about something more than you talk about God? Potentially it's an idol. And idolatry is sin. And of course there's the big one, self. The biggest idol in the world today. Social media has turned so many people into little gods, gathering worshippers, sorry, followers, and craving worship, sorry, likes. I tell you, you got to be careful with that stuff. Don't get so self-focused you become your own God. Next one, sorcery, which is getting into the magical arts. Uh, in some ways, this is actually an escalation of idolatry, witchcraft, fortune-telling, and it's something that I would move right past, but... Just want to pause for a moment. The word used is pharmakia, which is where we get the word pharmacy. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't be taking properly medically prescribed treatments. But there is a road at the end of natural medicine culture that leads to new age practices. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's some good natural treatments for things. But let me tell you, if you start and getting pins put in your body, you'll be careful. If you're starting to take a sleep remedy that a druid's prayed for, sorcery. Once it stops being natural and starts becoming supernatural, it's sin. Enmity, or some translations say, hatred. Now, this doesn't just mean the extreme, I wish that person was dead. It's all hostility. I wish you ill. I wish you'd fail. I can't stand you. Or, or here's one, I love you in the Lord, but I can't abide to be near you. Sin. Strife is the next one. This is an escalation of enmity. Hostility becomes quarreling, it becomes arguing, and you become the kind of person who enjoys getting into arguments, or gets into arguments easily. The contentious person, the hot-headed person. Let me tell you, sin. Jealousies. This is an interesting one. The Greek word is zealos, and it means zeal. It doesn't mean envy. We'll get to envy in a bit. This means boiling hot rage. It's that sense of indignation that somebody has something you don't have and you feel, that's not right. It's that sense where you've just spent time with someone and you walk out the room and you're like, Ooh. you just wanna boil over. Sin. Escalation of that, fits of anger, outbursts of wrath. Do you get angry with people and blow your top easily? Is it all their fault? Of course it is. They don't understand you. 
Rage. When you see red easily, let me tell you, it is not a cute character quirk. It's <coughs> sin. Next one, rivalry or selfish ambition. That is when you try and get ahead at the expense of somebody else. Sin. Next one, dissension. Standing apart, causing trouble, leading people astray, even when you think you're right. If you're causing division, sin. This also um, brings in, yes, causing division. If you're the kind of person where, if you're on their side, where you can't be on mine, or having a quiet word with the pastor to bring somebody else down, or because you look good, sin. Gossip comes into this, but we're going to come back to gossip in a bit. But talking about people behind their backs for gain or for pleasure or for whatever, sin. Factions is already up, the next one. The word for this is also the word used for heresy. This is leading people into false teachings. And the thing about this is you don't have to be a teacher to do it. All you need to do is get excited by the latest cool heresy that's going around the churches and start spreading it around. You must read this book. Have you read this book? Be very careful with cool new theology because that's how heresy spreads. The great thing about theology is it was pretty much settled 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Let me tell you, heresy spreads quickly because people like new things. A heresy that wasn't popular or made you feel good wouldn't spread. Don't get excited and carried away by all of the cool new teachers. Sometimes these cool new teachings come with a new version of the Bible, which is just twisted enough to justify the incorrect theology. Let me tell you, if somebody brings out a new translation of the Bible that's twice as thick as the old one, stuff must have been added. Yeah. Next one, envy. This isn't the burning zeal of jealousy. It's despising people who have what you don't have. It's not just wishing you have what they have. It's wishing they didn't have it. Um, a guy called R. Trench puts it like this. Without longing to raise oneself to the level of him who he envies, but only to depress the envied to his own level. It's not wanting to get up there. It's wanting to bring people down to your level. Sin. Are we doing okay? <laughs> okay. I'm asking that before we get to this next one. <laughs> Drunkenness. I mean, it kind of speaks for itself. But let me just get into this one a little bit, because it's less narrow than we first might think. Firstly, this is not an advocation of teetotalism. It's not drinking, it's drunkenness. This isn't just having too much alcohol, but this actual word is about intoxication. Any intoxication, legal or otherwise. Because teetotalism, I don't believe, scriptural, it's allowing a drink to become something you rely on. When that feeling of intoxication takes over. Let me tell you, if you need a drink, you're relying on it. You're getting addicted to it. You're having too much of it. And when it starts to control your decision making, it becomes sin. But let's not keep this too narrow. Alcohol is not the strongest legal addictive substance around. Nicotine is. And I'm sorry, but it's addictive, it's intoxicating, and it falls under this category. See, the problem with smoking isn't just that it affects you physically. See, if it was just something that was about the physical, And I think we've, we've, we've tackled this wrong in years before. We've, you know, it's, it's, I, I, it's not about the physical damage it does to your body. It's the fact that it gets a hold of your life. That's where the problem lies. And that's the issue is 
You see, vaping's becoming more and more popular. Vaping solves the health problem, but it doesn't deal with the control. Therefore, it doesn't deal with the actual sin problem. Next one, orgies. <laughs> now, it's easy to laugh at this one, but what really, essentially, when we're talking about orgies, or <laughs> barges, no, orgies. <coughs> Take all of this list so far and put it together into one big party, and that's orgies. And Paul then wraps it up with, and the like, just in case you've thought of something he hasn't, sin. And he says, all who practice them will not inherit the kingdom of God. So therefore, if that stuff, and look, this is a big list, and I've broadened this out, hopefully to include everybody. <laughs> because that means it's stuff we need to avoid, yeah? It's stuff we need to work on. It's stuff we need to stop. It's dangerous. You get more additions to this in Romans 1, verse 28 to 32. I'm not going to put that behind me because I really feel like I need to speed this bit up. So read this afterwards, Romans 1, 28 to 32. But I'll just touch on the ones that aren't mentioned already in this list. So here we can get malice, or in other words, spiteful. Deceitful people, or in other words, telling lies. But also being two-faced and manipulative. Next one, gossip. That's right, gossip is in this passage, and gossip is sin official. Slanderers, that's blackening people's names, sin. Faithless, heartless, ruthless, all sin. Next one, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 10, adultery. Now this one is specific. Not like the other word, this is a different word that does specifically mean sex with a married person outside of the marriage. And it's a different Greek word. Next one, homosexuality. Specifically listed as sin, despite what people want us to say. Now before we get too heated up about this one, especially with what's been going on in the news this week, this is one part of what is already a very long list, yeah? And let he who's doing nothing on this list be the one to cast the first stone. We need to, we need to stop pretending there's only one thing on this list, yeah? The world thinks there's only one thing on this list. It's part of a long list. But also, we need to stop acting like it's not on the list. Both are wrong. Interestingly, in the Greek, there's another word in here <laughs> that is not in most translations of the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible has it, but most other translations do not include this word. They just go, that's all homosexuality, one thing. But there's a specifically different word that is included in the Greek, and it's the word malakos. And actually, it's worth unbundling this word for a second, the word means effeminate, effemininity, <laughs> soft, delicate. Now, this is not a word that's used to support testosterone-filled toxic masculinity. Grr, you're only a real man if you say grr twice a day. No. It was a word used specifically to describe the temple prostitutes, the male temple prostitutes, who made themselves up to be like women. I think it's very interesting that that word's in there. Particularly today, in an age where gender barriers, gender fluidity, and all of those kinds of things are in the conversation, this word rarely comes into the discussion because most translations of the Bible don't have it in. But I think it mightn't end the discussion, but it should be included in the discussion. So when we say effeminate, we don't just mean men who are nice. It's this idea of men becoming like women. Also add to this list, theft. Add to this list, greed. Now they are all sins of commission. Things that you do. But there's also sins of omission. Things you don't do. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to the one who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to him it is sin. 
So if you thought you were doing really well on that last list, that probably hits like a cannonball. <laughs> because how many of us have come across the moments where there's the right thing to do and we didn't do it? Sin. Now it's a big list, but that's kind of the point. I don't know if there's any of us who'll get off scot-free with that whole list. Of at least one part of it. You know that. I know that. We can walk out the doors and pretend that's not true, but we know there's something in that list that we relate to. And we would do well not to keep narrowing the list, but widening the list to include us, because then we'd spend more time aware of our own danger points. All of those things can cause us to lead our faith into a car crash. But you know, there's some things that can do that that's not sin. Worry, anxiety, depression, not sin, but I tell you what, they can derail your faith. They're all things we get tempted by. All of those things, let me tell you, even if you've got pretty good mastery of that list, all of those things will come up as a temptation at some point. Eee, what did Pastor Luke say this morning? I tell you what, I was there. Uh, none of those were me, but I tell you what, so and so's a right gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Temptation is not sin, but it leads to sin. And temptation is the moment where you go, danger. Gotta press the brakes. How do we apply the brakes? Well, first thing we need is some perspective. Let me tell you, everything on that list matters eternally. And sometimes we can get into the habit of treating certain sins differently because of the temporal effects they have. We can go, murder and adultery are more damaging which they are more damaging to somebody's life, but we can go, they're, they're far more serious than gossip or pride or greed because they have a different effect that you can see. And as a result, we tend to see some sin as not as important or lesser. We can even come up with the argument, well, it's not hurting anyone. <coughs> or the only person it affects is me. But you see, effects and wages are different. The effects might be different, but the wages payable on death are the same. We need to get a heavenly perspective on our sin. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your minds on the things that are above, not the things that are on earth. Let me tell you, you won't press the brakes unless you see the danger. And the reason I have widened that list up so much this morning to include so many things that sometimes we don't normally touch on is to say, look, got to press the brakes. I can't press the brakes for you. I am not in the driving seat of your life. But you've got to press the brakes. Because ignoring the danger doesn't stop you hitting it. I learned that in the first few months of driving very quickly. I had a nickname when I first started driving. Crash Bandaluk. Because <laughs> I would crash quite a lot. You've got to realize if something's there to hit, don't hit it. Press the brakes. Because ignoring it won't make it go away. Then you need to realize something else. You can't stop the car with your foot. Human effort will not make the difference. It is not self that stops you. It is not the world's ideas, a 12-step program to stop doing something that's going to stop you. It is the self-control that comes from the Spirit of God that stops you. It is part of the spirit nature of your life. And that's what Paul says in the next verse after the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The second thing is we need to realize that avoiding sin or other things that derail your faith, if it becomes an act, of the, sorry, the second it becomes an act of the will, it is doomed to fail. 
Your foot can't stop the car. And some of us have got extremely sore feet. As we grow in God, our fruit should grow. That includes self-control. It means the more you live in the Spirit, the better you should be at controlling yourself in areas that used to control you. You should get better at it. The longer you've been saved, the more should have been beaten. And if it's not, then you need to question that. See, it's not okay to say, well, this is just who I am. It's been part of my life for so long now. It's just, it's just part of me. Don't write off sin as a personality quirk. It is not okay to accept areas of sin, addiction, or even areas that bring discouragement and depression. Those things need self-control applying to them. And here's the big problem with sin. Sin has a pleasure response attached to it. That's why we do it. If sin didn't have pleasure attached, we wouldn't do it. Sexual sin has an obvious pleasure response. Theft means you gain something without paying for it. That can be a nice feeling. Pride has a pleasure response because you feel like you're doing better than everybody else. That feels good. Gossip is described in scripture as being like a tasty morsel. Or as I like to put it, it's like steak wrapped in bacon. It tastes amazing, but it does you no good whatsoever. It's a pleasure response. Lying has the pleasure response of you getting you out of a sticky situation. When we face temptation, when these things come up, very often what happens is we remember the pleasure and we forget the pain. We remember the pleasure, we forget how guilty we feel afterwards. We only remember that bit when it's too late. Even though that pain comes quickly afterwards in most cases, we forget it was there. Your brakes need to override your temptation. Like a caliper brake, like a brake caliper. Self-control needs to push up against the momentum and to cause the friction. Let me tell you, you can't take the heat and the friction that stopping your sin will take. But the spirit is built out of material that can cope with any heat. The spirit can cope with any heat you throw at it. Self-control works, I believe, very similar to a car's brake. Your foot is not strong enough to stop a car. But your foot initiates the action. Your foot starts the work off by pressing the brake. Your will is not strong enough to stop your sin and to stop your temptations. But your will can initiate the work of the Spirit. The brakes take the heat and the pressure. The Spirit takes the heat and the pressure. But you make the decision to press the brake. You make the decision to rely on the Spirit and let the Spirit carry out the work. Self-control is an act of the Spirit working in tandem with your will. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is enough to defeat any sin. Because the victory of sin took place on the cross. Jesus has already won the victory. Jesus has already broke the controlling power of sin in the life of a believer. But what we need to do is trust in the work of Jesus. Trust into what Jesus has done. Let me tell you, you can say no to your evil nature. Because Jesus living in you is stronger than the pull of sin. You don't need to claim victory over sin in your life because you've already got it. He did it 2,000 years ago. And the key to defeating sin is to give up on self, rely on Jesus' work on the cross, and rely on the Spirit of God to do the work. When temptation comes to you, let me tell you, you have everything you need to defeat temptation. 
Everything. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. No, you might not. You will not. It is with the help of the Spirit. It is through the Spirit. But the work has to be initiated by you. The Spirit does the hydraulic work, making the effect of pressing that brake stronger than your will could ever be by itself. That allows the Spirit to take the pressure and the heat and stop temptation dead in its tracks. But you need to apply your foot. It's self control in the power of the Spirit of God. I wonder this morning how are your bricks? Are you using them? It's very hard to drive without using your bricks. You know, your spiritual bricks are not like natural bricks in one big sense. The more you use your natural bricks, the more you wear them down. The more you use your spiritual bricks, the stronger they become. The more you exercise self-control, the more you rely on the Spirit of God, the stronger you become. But let me leave you with a thought. It doesn't matter how strong your brakes are if you don't observe sensible stopping distances. It's amazing how many drivers don't pay attention to stopping distance. And how many of those drivers like to drive behind me? <laughs> Let me tell you, a great many accidents are caused as a result of poor stopping distance. We were driving up from London yesterday and we came to a little bit of road where it says, keep at least two chevrons apart. And it's amazing to see how many people just don't do it. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of us treat sin. It'll be okay. I'll stop in time. How often does the question get asked, how far? is too far before it's sin. How close can I go before sin? How much can I talk about someone before it becomes gossip? Maybe if I go this far, I'll be okay. Because that's not sin. That's just showing concern, isn't it? <laughs> that is not the scriptural way. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee! from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all those who call the Lord from a pure heart. Flee. In other words, go as far as possible in the other direction. Go the other way. Flee it. Don't ask the question, what can I get away with? Maybe just a little bit of sharing about, I've got cons I tell you what, I'm not, I'm not gossiping. I'm just saying, here's something I think you should pray about. <laughs> That's got to be okay, hasn't it? But the biblical approach is flee. Don't get close, avoid it. You know, if there was a road off the edge of a cliff, you wouldn't drive as close as possible to it to get the best view. You would drive as far that way as possible. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, abstain from every form of evil. Every form, not just the stuff that makes the headlines. If you have to ask the question, is this sin, what motivation does that display? Hey, how much can I annoy God before I annoy him too much? Really? Is that the way you want to live? If you have to say, is that, am I allowed to do this? How about err on the side of, if there's a chance God's not going to like it, I ain't going to do it. Don't pursue stuff that's anywhere close. Instead, pursue holiness. 
Let me tell you, brakes are no use if you get too close or press them too late. We spent a lot of time this morning on a list of things to avoid. Let me tell you, that list is not to condemn any person in this room, but to warn you of obstacles that are in the road. And some stuff may be a process to beat. And you might be sat there this morning thinking, I can't beat that. I'm not strong enough to do that. I'm not strong enough to give up that addiction. I'm not strong enough to hold back those depression feelings. I'm not strong enough to hold back my mouth. And it's true. You're not. But Jesus is. Jesus defeated your sin on the cross. Let me tell you, he can take it. Trust in Jesus. Don't trust in yourself. He takes what little pressure you have and like hydraulics he magnifies it the spirit takes the pressure and makes it stronger and the spirit deals with the friction if you rely on the spirit and not on the self let me tell you you will grow in self control there's four mistakes we can make when it comes to our bricks Number one is pretending there's no danger. Let me tell you, it's there, and you'll hit it. And when you hit it, you'll know it. I've got time to tell you this. <laughs> you know up um, near the library, there's, um, where the buses, the buses are? It used to be like a dual carriageway there. Um, and then there was like parking for the buses at the side. And there's a little bit jutting out, yeah? And on the top of that bit jutting out, there's a, ba a bollard with a, um, a reflector on it. I think I take the credit for that reflector. <laughs> because once, I was driving up there before that reflector was in place, trying to get the last Pringle out of the Pringle pot. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I did not realize that that little dual carriageway turned into one lane. <laughs> and I hit that little outcrop. <laughs> quite hard and burst two tires <laughs> i tell you what there's something very frustrating about thinking you've burst one tire and changing it to discover the other one's gone <laughs> you can pretend the danger's not there you'll know it when you hit it second is waiting for the holy spirit to press the brake for you that takes away any responsibility that you have You've got to press the brake. The third is trying in the flesh instead of the spirit and trying to stop the car with your feet. And the fourth is not watching your stopping distance. Let me tell you, you can get those four things right. You will not make a car crash of your faith. Check your brakes. Use your brakes and watch your stopping distances.